Thanks for coming. My name is Ian Lake. And I'm Jeremy Woods. And today we're here to talk to you about fragments. Not just fragments of today, but fragments of the past, present, and we're going to give you a little sneak peek about where we're going with fragments in the future. So starting with the past, um, fragments were introduced in Android Honeycomb, API 11. Uh, but we don't really talk about Honeycomb. Um, <laughs> So we'll move on to what they're originally supposed to do. And fragments were really designed from the beginning to kind of be micro activities. Right? Remember way back in the day when everything was in your activity? And fragments were really kind of that very first step into moving code out of your activity and into something smaller. Um, but that also meant that we inherited a lot of the API service that was inherent in activity. So that means that we got things like all the action bar menu stuff, because there wasn't something called toolbar yet. It also meant that we had things like context menus, which does anyone actually use context menus anymore? Um, they're a thing, but they don't really need to be on activities or fragments per se. Um, they could be on views themselves. It also meant that we got a lot of custom hooks. So all the things that were normally just sent to your activity, are now also sent to your fragment. For instance, things like on activity result. That's pretty useful. People use that, right? Things like permissions. When Android M came out and we added runtime permissions, of course fragments got it because activity got it. And also things like on multi-window mode changed, or on picture-in-picture -picture mode changed. And these are all kind of things that we just got kind of for free being fragments and being this idea that there are micro activities. But when you think about it, a lot of these things aren't specific to fragments. Right? It'd be nice if anything could get these kind of callbacks. So we've kind of gone through this kind of existential crisis on kind of moving away from this idea that, oh, it's like, oh, just because an activity can do it, a fragment can do it. So that kind of leads us to today. That was 2011. And we've tried to come a long way since then. And a lot of this is really trying to restructure what is our goal for fragments. And some of this is really just being a focused API service, really making sure that it's just the core piece that you need with predictable, sane behavior. That means no surprises, no things that just randomly don't work. But it also means we don't want to break existing consumers. Right, and that means binary, source, or even behavior compatibility. Now, along the way, that does mean that we do have times when we introduce a new alternative, a new API that is predictable and nice, and we deprecate the old API because we can't actually remove it until we have a good alternative that gives you something much better to work with. But the idea is that we do want to release a 2.0 at some point, where as long as you're not using the deprecated APIs, if you're all on the good new API surfaces, then it'll be an easy transition over and we'll be able to cut out a lot of code out of fragments to support these kind of more legacy cases. So what are we doing to get there? Um, well, the first part of providing kind of a sane API is a testable API. Um, if you're writing code that you can't test, that's no good. Um, and if we're writing a library that you can't test code written with that library, that's not going to work either. Um, so in 2019 here, we really want to make that better. So we have a fragment testing artifact now that offers fragment scenario. This is really a way of kind of testing just one fragment in isolation. And we worked really closely with the Android X test team. So this is actually built on activity scenario which means it works for instrumentation tests and it works for roboelectric tests. Now, we wanted to make sure that this had kind of a nice small API service. So it really has like one main method of on fragment, which is takes a Lambda, gives you the fragment instance that's available already. And it also kind of gives you a lot of the hooks that you need that makes it really easy to test things like lifecycle and recreating your whole fragment. So what does this look like? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Um, you create your scenario. 
using launch fragment in container, which will do all of the creating your activity, adding the fragment, moving it to resumed. And then we can just do espresso tests, right? We just say on view, click it. And the fragments hierarchy is already there. It's already ready. And then we can use on fragment to then check our internal state, check to see did it actually handle the click correctly. For example, if you're doing more complicated things, right, if you want to check how when you move through lifecycle states, you can just call it scenario move to state and move it to started or created or resumed. Same thing with actually testing recreation, right? Do I save and restore my state properly? Just call recreate. You can check your state before recreate. You can check your state after recreate, and that's all you really need to do. So the other bit was we have this recreation thing. Well, that's really just one of many ways that you need to instantiate a fragment, right? So we also have cases where you're adding a new fragment in the first place. Right? You need to instantiate a fragment to give it to Fragment Manager. And, um, but also we have things like Fragment Scenario. You need to inflate the fragment to add it to your UI for testing, right? So we wanted one way of doing this. And this one way is Fragment Factory. So this gives us kind of a way to now finally be able to do constructor injection into your fragments and kind of move away from this requirement that you need a no argument constructor. Now you can actually build something that does all of this for you. So what does this look like? Well, a simple fragment factory, it's really just one method, instantiate, um, where you're given a class name and it's up to you to load the class. Um, so super.instantiate will just use reflection, call your no arg constructor. Um, but really, you can do anything you want with this. Um, if you watch the opinionated guide to dependency injection, this is the kind of thing that we'd love to do for you at some point. Um, so you don't have to write this. Um, but even right now, if you just pass in arguments into your factory, then you get a really easy way of just passing those on to the fragments that care about them uh, using constructor injection here. So then, all you need to do in your activity is just call fragment factory and set it equal to your factory, preferably before super.onCreate, because that's when we're going to be reinstantiating fragments. Now, the other bit that we want to do to kind of fix up all of this you know, consistency everywhere um, is, um, sorry, uh, is all the other places that you have fragment creation. So if you're doing a commit and you're adding a fragment, now instead of having to do this whole instantiating and doing all that constructor injection, you can just add it with a class name. Here we're using the Kotlin reified version. So now we'll delegate to your factory and now you have one code path for doing instantiating here for the very first time when you're adding or replacing a fragment. Similarly, when you're doing your fragment scenario, you just pass the factory. Um, it could be a mock factory that you've created just to give mock dependencies, um, or it could be a real factory if you're trying to do more integration test style work. So I'm gonna pass it off to Jeremy to talk about another area we're working on consistency. Um, so one inconsistency we found between adding a fragment to something like, say, a frame layout versus using the fragment tag is it turns out the fragment tag adds fragments using a totally different system from fragment transactions. To provide consistent behavior, we built Fragment Container View as the one true container for fragments. Fragment Container View extends frame layout, but it only allows fragment views. This means if you're not a fragment, you probably shouldn't be using this. It also can replace the fragment tag <clears throat> when you add the class or, or Android name attribute. So in this example, because Fragment Container View actually does use a fragment transaction under the hood, you don't have to worry about, you don't have any issues with replacing this fragment later. Fragment Container View also gave us the opportunity to address some animation issues, specifically an issue with the Z ordering of fragments. So here we can see the frame la in the frame layout example, the Entering fragment instantly pops onto the screen. What's actually happening here is the entering animation is sliding, but it's underneath the exiting animation. Fragment container view ensures the Z ordering so we can actually see the sliding, the sliding animation for the entering fragment, providing predictable, same behavior across all API levels. Another long-standing issue we had is handling the system back from a fragment. To address this, 
we add the own back press dispatcher. Instead of adding a fragment only API, now any component can handle a back event via a new API on the base activity class component activity. Ideally, you'd inject the own back press dispatcher for testing purposes, but here we're going to show you how to use it in code. So a fragment will grab a dispatcher from its calling activity or from its activity, and then we'll create a callback. Here we create that callback using the Kotlin Lambda, and we pass it this. And we can pass the fragment because the fragment is a lifecycle owner. So for example, in your code, the user presses back, and then we call show confirm dialog when the back button is pressed. And then the user will say they want to exit anyway. We'll disable the callback, and then we'll use the dispatcher to actually do the back press. So no new fragment API. Instead, we just take advantage of the existing integration between fragments and architecture components. So an architecture components are something we want to leverage even more going forward. So for example, it should be easy to get a view model from your for your fragment. And here we create the Kotlin property extensions so you can get a view model at the fragment level, the nav graph level, or the activity level. So your view model is always properly scoped and you have the tools to provide that. We're also leaning to the lifecycle as well. For example, instead of using the custom lifecycle method of set user visible hint, you can now just use regular lifecycle methods when you're adding fragments to a view page or one adapter. Um, and so this is currently how view pager two works, and only your current fragment will be resumed. Back to Ian. Great, thanks, Jeremy. Um, that was a really good rundown of kind of what's available right now. Um, so fragment 1.1 had a lot of this. The fragment container view is in fragment 1.2, um, which is in RC1 as of yesterday. But I, the other thing is I want to talk a little bit more about where we're going, kind of longer term. Um, there's a lot of other things that we want to do, so I'm going to share a little bit of a preview of some of the projects that we're working on. But of course, because none of this is out yet, um, this is all subject to change. I'm pretty happy with where this is all going, um, but it's not something you can play with right today. So the first thing is multiple back stacks. Um, some of you may have heard of this, um, it's a thing. Um, but really, some of this comes down to just that existing legacy on Android. Um, so on Android, especially at like the activity level, it was always a single stack of activities, right? And fragments just ended up inheriting kind of that same structure where the only things that are saved are the things that are on the back stack. And we really wanna move to a model where we kind of support both not just the single stack approach, but also the multiple stack approach. And really that just means that we allow you to save the state of fragments that aren't actually visible on the screen um, without losing their state. So this is some of the cases that came up was really like bottom nav, things like navigation views. And we have a sample app right now that uses kind of a little bit of a uh, workaround. Um, say work run, it's some, some nasty fragment code. Um, and really we would just want to make this really easy at kind of the fragment level. Um, so kind of the approach that we're taking is kind of that same ability where each one of these tabs um, can actually have its own stack. So it has its own state. So as you swap between these, it's really more about saving and then restoring a different stack, right? And we're taking care of doing all the state restoration and state staving as you go from stack to stack. The other bit that we want to work around is around returning results. Um, so we've heard a lot of you know, information where you're like, how do I talk between fragments? Right? How do I talk between anything on Android? Um, there's always kind of, uh, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing it, um, some better than others. Um, and it turns out that the fragment APIs we have right now are not um, so we have this whole like set target fragment API that allows you to connect one fragment with another and basically just keep a hard reference to another fragment. But it basically does nothing for the life cycle of what that other fragment is. So if that other fragment's on the back stack, it's not stop it's actually stopped, right? It's not started. And if you actually talk to that fragment and it's trying to do like fragment transactions and stuff, that's going to fail because you're not started. 
So we really don't have any kind of guarantees around like, wait, what state is that other fragment actually going to be in? Additionally, we had like this you know, idea that like, oh, you can use on activity result. I'm like, intense from fragment to fragment? Like, that feels kind of weird. Like, we don't really need to be reusing some of these API surfaces for callbacks. So we're really kind of looking at this more holistically, um, not just fragment to fragment, but also things like start activity for result. Can we do kind of the same kind of API surface for start activity for result, for fragment to fragment communication, from navigation destination to navigation destination? Um, can we provide kind of a common API that all these things can kind of talk at so that when you're building callbacks, it doesn't actually matter if it's coming from a different activity or a different fragment. Um, so that's kind of where we kind of see a lot of those APIs going. I'm really excited to share some of that in just a few uh, months, maybe. <laughs> um, the other thing is, and something we've constantly heard feedback on on fragments is lifecycle. Like, that's hard, right? Um, well, it's like doubly hard with fragments because fragments have two life cycles. Uh, the fragment itself has a life cycle, um, which is when the fragment is actually attached to the fragment manager um, until it's removed from the fragment manager and gets destroyed. But the fragment's view has a totally separate life cycle um, where when you actually put something on the back stack, its view gets destroyed, but the fragment lives on. So crazy idea. What if they were the same? <laughs> um, so we have this idea, or what if when the fragment's view was destroyed, the fragment was destroyed at the same time, and then when we want to recreate your view, we recreate your fragment. And bringing kind of these things together saves so much complexity and means that things like Fragment Factory and all the saving state that you have to do anyways for cases like, oh, I'm on configuration change, right? The process death and coming back. Now that just becomes the default option. Um, and now you only have to test one code path of like, wait, what state am I in? Am I, are my observers doing the wrong thing here because these switching life cycles? Um, now, I do realize this is a bigger change. Um, so we are looking at making this kind of an opt-in kind of API at the fragment activity kind of level. So everything in that fragment activity would all move to this new world um, where we have a much more simplified lifecycle uh, case. So we're really looking forward to releasing all of these things. Um, and we'd really appreciate it if you can talk to us in the sandbox if you've got any feedback. Also, using the issue tracker.google.com um, if you have any feedback or other feature requests that you'd love to see in Fragments. Thank you.